Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Generation Next show. My name is Hannah Gronowski Barnett, and this is my husband. Yeah, Aaron, what's up? <laughs> We're so excited to be back. Um, for those of you who have been watching the Generation Next show here for the last few months, we started this all the way back in March. Crazy. Um, we're so glad you guys are here. We were off last week. If mm -hmm. you all missed us, we're so glad you did. We missed, we missed you, you all. Um, but last week, Aaron and myself, we were running a three-day event. Um, Generation Distinct is the nonprofit that I am the CEO and founder of. And we had this really cool gathering for almost 30 young amazing. leaders from all over the country who came to Chicago to be mentored, empowered, developed. And they're all people who have been through the Generation Distinct cohort. It was, so cool. it was a really cool experience. So that's where we were last week, but we're back and we're here for some more great conversations. And we're just, again, so grateful coming back even mm -hmm. to know that there is this tribe, this community of people right. who are gathering right. around the conversation of how do we effectively reach the next generation Aaron, I know we're so passionate about this conversation, mm -hmm. about this topic. Yeah. Again, if, if this is somebody's first time tuning into the show, why do you love kind of the conversations we're having on the Generation Next show? Yeah, I just think it's all future. Like, how yeah. do we empower the future of the church? And I think it's so exciting with the next generation, and sp especially when we have amazing guests like Ashley on. coming on the show. But we are so excited to have this conversation yeah. because we believe, Hannah and I, mm -hmm. that the future of the church is bright. Mm -hmm. And so I think the next generation maybe gets a bad rap. Maybe mm -hmm. they get a narrative that's fun about them, that they're running away from the church. Yeah. But we're having conversations on this show about um, individuals that are leading the next generation yeah. and the beauty that they find in the next generation. That's why we're having an incredible guest, That's right. Ashley, on the show. Ashley, welcome. We're so excited we're to have so you. We're so glad you're here. Oh my goodness. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited uh, to be part of the community. This yeah, is so this awesome. is so awesome. This is great. So for those watching, if you've been watching the last few weeks, you know that we're currently in a series called Women In. And we're really exploring kind of some of the traditional roles that we see mm. in the church and in ministry today, but from the perspective mm. of women in those roles. And I think this conversation is really important, especially so for the next generation, yeah. because what you have, if you're a church leader, if you're a pastor, if you are a youth pastor, what you what you have rising up in your church are young leaders, mm. and they're both men and women. And sometimes in, in previous kind of generations of the church, we have maybe been unsure of how to fully empower both the men and women to raise up into those leadership roles. And man, we know though now that more than mm. ever, like we we need every young person we can to help us build the future of the church. And that means every yeah. man and yeah. every young woman. And so um, this conversation is all about how can we maximize mm. our impact for the kingdom? Well, it's going to look like empowering the young man and the young women to step into these positions of leadership within our local churches. And so many of you guys, maybe you are a youth pastor, maybe you're a young adult pastor, maybe you're even a leader of a church and you're looking to hire somebody for your youth ministry and you're trying to figure out who should I be looking for? What does this mean? And, and how do I empower more people? Or maybe um, you are somebody who's working with the next generation. You think there's there's a lot mm -hmm. of people I want to invest in, but how do I how do I make sure that I'm raising up right, the men, but right. maybe you're a male youth pastor and you want to raise up some women in your youth ministry. Like, like there are some, there's some really important conversations here. And that's why we wanted to bring in a woman that we so respect, a woman who is killing it, a woman who it. knows youth ministry and has been in it in the most like deep end way. She is dove in and now she's in many ways an expert on all things youth ministry, next gen, communicating to the middle schoolers, all of things. We're going to talk about it all, but Ashley, we're so glad you're here. So tell our watchers about the brilliance of who you are. Oh my goodness. First of all, I think you guys, I just need you on my like hype team for life. Hey, like, that's great. 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 Professional that. hype team members right I here. I want a t-shirt that says we love Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, um, thank you for that introduction. Um, I have been working with teenagers for over 20 years in first oh, educational, athletic, and ministry okay. settings. Um, and it's been really cool to learn about teenagers, not just through the years, but in different settings mm. and how they let their guard down in different settings. 
um, and what we can learn about teenagers, not just culturally, but developmentally in those different settings. So it's been really cool. I currently serve as the director of middle school strategy at Orange. Um, we are, Orange is a bunch of resource and content creators um, and experience creators. We create resources and experiences for anyone who works with the next generation. Um, and I get a chance to serve on our student team um, where we create resources for parents and volunteers and direct to middle and high schoolers. And I love it so much. Um, prior to this, I served at two churches as a youth pastor one in Atlanta, Georgia, and one in Baltimore, Maryland. Oh, wow. And prior to that was a middle school health teacher in the public schools. Thank you very much. Wow. All the fun That's stuff. Hero. What grade? Yes. What'd what you say? Grade? What grade did you um, teach? Sixth, seventh, and eighth grade health education. Oh, come on. Mm -hmm. And a um, middle and high school girls soccer coach. Wow. So, yeah. Who has been around the next generation just like <laughs> which is amazing and and honestly this is a really fun conversation for me so those of you watching who don't know um, when I was about 19 years old I was um, working at my local church and our youth pastor kind of burnt out at the time mm. and so as you do and maybe a lot of you watching can relate because this is how you ended up in youth ministry but I was the young person on the team at the time and so they thought well Hannah could probably help us with this and so I ended up in a lot of ways, running the youth ministry at the church that I had just graduated out of. And I didn't have a lot of resources mm -hmm. or know what to do, but there was an amazing podcast that Orange put out that I would listen to religiously to try and give me some sort of understanding about how to run youth ministry. I went to their conferences, I went to their tour, and I used the content that Orange created for middle schoolers and high schoolers to help so like amazing. give us something to our small group leaders our speakers would use their outlines like it was it was our lifeline in a lot of ways equipping so us to reach the next gen in our church and in our community and so I love what Orange is doing and I love people like Ashley who are who are helping them do it so Ashley let's just dive into this conversation I think it's I think it's so important you know you are obviously somebody who has a lot of experience in this but let's kind of rewind the tape mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. moment when you first found yourself in youth ministry. I know some of your story, you didn't expect necessarily to go into youth ministry. So when that was first kind of offered to you, like what were some of the wow. myths of youth ministry that you wow. had in your mind that you had to get debunked in order to fully walk into that role? Oh my gosh. Oh, I love this question. Um, <clears throat> okay. Backing up to like growing up, I grew up in denomination and church that didn't have um, women in leadership roles. And I never questioned it because I didn't see anything different. And somebody way smarter than me said something like, kids will only be what they can see. Wow. And, wow. Um, but I wanted to be like, I feel like God put something in me to want to be a teacher. Like since I was a kid, I never played like baby Barbie wedding growing up. I played teacher, gave my neighbors homework. My parents like helped me set up this like whole classroom in my basement. Wow. <clears throat> And I aspired to be a teacher. I would give my neighbors homework, get mad when they didn't do it. And um, <laughs> <laughs> seriously. And so I like set out to be um, an educator. And when I selected health education, um, mm -hmm. I selected it because I was like, I want to teach a subject that like matters to their everyday life right now and will help set them up to win in the future. And so I picked health education because I want to talk about things like decision making and mental health and stress and friendship and healthy relationship and choices and goal setting and like all the things basically you talk about as a pastor, but I couldn't talk about Jesus because there's the public school system. Right. Um, but I was like, I didn't realize I was a, a youth pastor as a health educator. Um, I just, you know, it set me up well. So if anybody's, you know, interested in youth ministry, it's a great degree to start with. We can talk about that another time. Um, but I moved to Maryland. I was grew up in Cleveland, Ohio area and moved to Maryland because they have one of the most advanced health education um, systems in the country. And so I love that they hired health only teachers, not health and PE, but health only teachers K through 12. Um, and would invest in students. And I was like, that sounds awesome. Started volunteering in my youth ministry, um, which was awesome. It was actually <laughs> the, the first youth ministry I ever set foot in because as a teenager, can I just say, I was the kid who was at the tournament, the soccer basketball tournament every weekend. Uh, that everybody gets really frustrated 
oh, that was me. <laughs> that was awesome. So oh, I was never great. even part of a youth ministry growing wow. up. Wow. Uh, which is hilarious. And then my friends were like, Hey, you, you know, work with teenagers all the time, like come serve in the youth ministry. I was like, okay, I need friends. I just moved here. <laughs> so I did. Wow. And I loved it. I was like, man, I wish I was part of something like this when I was growing up. Wow. Um, and I had some really awesome, um, actually male leaders who saw something in me, spoke it into me and really started opening doors for me. And then I actually um, attended a leadership conference, the Willow Creek Global Leadership Summit. And um, I, I remember I was a volunteer there with my church. And um, I remember this woman, this firecracker took the stage named Christine King. And I remember sitting there with my mouth wide open, like who is this woman who is teaching scripture with such confidence, authority, energy and passion. Like I just had never seen a woman do that. Wow. And so, I feel like God birthed something in me. And wow. I was telling Hannah this not too long ago, just like in that moment, God birthed something in me. I didn't ever th think it would mean like leaving my yeah. teaching job. Cause I was like, I love my teaching job. But, yeah. um, some lady at her name was Glenda and she came with the church as well. I didn't even know her that well. She walks up to me after the session with Christine Kane's book in her hand. And she's like, I don't know what God's doing in you, but God told me to go buy this for you. Oh, yeah. And I looked at her because I hadn't even told anybody what I was thinking because I was like trying to find words around what I was processing. Oh, that's um, so and so I so believed it. And then like fast forward years and the same thing happens. I finished teaching a group of middle schoolers and a girl in the front row says to me, Ashley, come here. I jump off the stage and she's like, hi, my name's Caroline. I'm like, hi, Caroline, I'm Ashley. And she's like, how do I do what you just did? Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I saw me and I was like, I wish I had seen this so much earlier in my life. Not mm -hmm. that I would change my career path because I think it set me up so well, but I just like felt I had a great opportunity to walk her down to Kidman and connect her to become a storyteller in Kidman and start getting some reps in wow. and start pursuing that dream. But I don't know. I just... I wow. feel like I'm, I've made a pact with myself that I will say yes as many times as I need to. So, so young girls and young guys can see females leading in the church. Come on, that's I, so good. I got chills. I, and this is my second time hearing this story, but I get chills every time I hear that. So because, cool. And I even get a little bit emotional because I just really believe that that is something that, unless mm -hmm. you've related to it, right? Like, and, and for some people, like people of color, I know this is a really important thing as well for them when they, they first see that person of color, that person that looks like them get up on stage and preach. Yeah. Like there is truly mm -hmm. something about representation that it's not tokenism. It's not about, we need to look diverse. It's truly because there is something powerful when you see somebody that you mm -hmm. can relate to, that God can use that to mm -hmm. spark the calling in your own life. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it was for you, it was Christine Kane, the Global Leadership Summit. I told you this for me, it was actually at Orange Conference where I saw a young woman named Lindsay get up on stage and give a talk. And I was 18 years old in this big arena. And I, th I, I heard God say, you're going to do that one day. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so, it's so important. And especially in this conversation about women in one of the reasons that this conversation is important is for those of you watching right now, if maybe you are a, a head pastor who is a man, or maybe you're a youth pastor who's a man, or maybe you're just a man in your community trying to figure out how do we get help the next generation. Like if you, if you want to help the next generation of women in your church, understand that they can have a voice and they can lead in the kingdom of God. One of the best things you can do mm -hmm is have that I see in you conversation that we heard that Ashley had so like a, a pastor looked at her and said, I see this in you. And then give them examples of yeah. other women a little bit further along that are also doing mm. it because there's something about representation that yeah. really matters. And so if you, if you look at your stage and it's only men, but you're trying to get your women to know that you can step into those spaces, there's, there's going to be a challenge there, right? Yeah. Ashley? Yeah. And uh, to unpack my story just a little more, like as I was volunteering and teaching in the community, it was like, I, I was given so many great opportunities that I'm forever grateful for. And the guys that saw something in me before I saw it in myself and spoke it into my life before I could even find the words to put, speak mm -hmm. it at all. Um, 
but when they, when the middle school pastor position opened, um, cause the middle school pastor, um, moved up to be the high school pastor. I remember Jason Fullen came to me and he was like, Hey, I really think this job is yours. My friend, Adam Workman came to you. My friend, Kevin McMonagall came to me and they're all like, Hey, like, we really think this is, you need wow. to step into this. Wow, and wow. I, my response, I'm dead serious. I was like, I think you're on crack. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, I have set out to be a teacher. I have my wow. undergrad and master's in education. I like, I, I love it more my sixth year than I do my, did my first. I don't, I'm, I'm fine. I'll be the number one volunteer, number one fan. And, um, so it took like a year and a half of me kicking and screaming my way into full-time injury. Not because I didn't think I would like it. I just loved what I was doing so much. Wow. I remember when the, a year after they came to me, I would, all I kept saying to myself is, is I don't, I can't be a youth pastor. I've, I've studied to be an educator like this. Wow. I don't know enough about the Bible. I didn't go to seminary. I didn't like, I know about teenagers and I know about talking to their parents. I know like develop adolescent development and like how to break content down and have a great conversation. But like, I didn't know enough. I felt like I just didn't know enough yet. And I was like, I mean, you guys can do so much better than me. Wow, wow. You know, like I I don't know. I, I I'll be their, you know, their volunteer. And wow. so a year after they interviewed like so many people, they would come back to me and they're like, we really think it's still for you. I'm like, what is wrong with you wow. guys? Like, I will help you find somebody. Like, let me see the resumes. It wasn't until I started looking at the resumes. I was like, oh well, maybe maybe I do have a comparable wow. resume to wow. that. I like literally didn't, I was like all about because you know, in education world, it's all about like what degrees do you have? What experience do you have? What have you been trained in? Like, so I started like reading them and I'm like, oh. So then they were like, well, will you at least pray about it? And I'm like, no, wow. I know what that means. <laughs> wow. I, and I'm like just fighting it because I just didn't I'm an Enneagram three. I didn't want to be bad at it. Yeah, yeah. You know, sure. I didn't want to let I'm someone a, down. One of my three on the Enneagram too. So that's, yeah. I, I get you it. feel me. You're like, I'm not going to do something I'm not going to be good at, you know? Right. So um, I did yeah. start praying about it. And I felt like God said to me in it, the first thing was, um, Ashley, you're using the gifts I gave you to teach students about a physical health. It's just temporary. I want you to teach them about the spiritual health that's eternal. And I was like, whoo. <laughs> Tweet that. Put that in the chat. I know. I was like, well, I didn't think of that. And then I was like, but God, I'm a light in a dark place. Like I am yeah. like, I have this leadership group of 55 students, 54 of them were female and one of them was male. And I'm like, I got to invest in them on top of being their teacher, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. I'm like, I am a light in a dark place. Like I get wow. to be the biggest cheerleader for all of these students. Like wow. I, like you put this in me. And I remember the second thing God said is, I'm asking you to leave what you love because it's harder than leaving what you don't love. And it requires more faith. Are you surprised? Wow. Oh, wow. Are you yeah. Surprised? I'm like, God and I have this kind of like a very direct relationship of like, <laughs> you better say it clearly to me. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise I'll run. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Ashley, That's I so am hard. so excited for this convo. I, I have a quick question I would love to unpack with you. So I got to lead middle schoolers myself for a period of time. And one thing that I love about middle schoolers, I think they're overlooked. Um, one thing that uh, like a thought process comes to mind with middle schoolers is I think they rise to the level of language that we speak to them about. Mm. And I think more often than not, the narrative is like, oh, they're just middle schoolers. They don't care about their faith that much. You know, they don't uh, really care about Jesus all that much. They're just like sidetracked with like playing on the playground or playing with their friends when in all reality, I, I feel like that's a lie because there's no junior Holy spirit, but that's a whole nother conversation. But what I feel with middle schoolers is that they rise to the language that we speak to them about mm -hmm. culturally. Um, I was leading a small group of middle schoolers. And one thing that we talked about all the time is like, Hey, this is like a tree of trust. Like whatever you say here, like, I just want to let you know, like, um, I'm for you. I believe in you. I'm with you. I'm excited for like, if you care about like talking to some girl in your school, you know, I would love to unpack uh, culturally with um, middle schoolers with you. What are some things that we um, maybe miss when it comes down to the next generation of young people, middle schoolers that we, that you have learned in your experience, Ashley, about being a woman in ministry 
um, how do we actually put a healthy culture around middle schoolers and what does that kind of look like? Mm. How do we put healthy culture around middle schoolers? Do you mean like church culture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm always going to advocate for creating an environment specifically mm. for middle schoolers. Mm. Um, and I know yeah. that, you know, around the country, we call them different things, junior hires, you know, preteens, middle school. I know everybody divides it differently. Five to eight, six mm -hmm. to eight, seven and eight, seven to nine. Like we, it's all over. It's, that's one of the most complicated things. Yeah. <laughs> like, but I, I would say creating uh, an environment that's specific to middle school because middle schoolers aren't just big elementary students and they're not just little high schoolers, they're middle schoolers. Yeah. And they think like middle schoolers and they talk like middle schoolers and they process wow. information like middle schoolers. And yeah. I think there just aren't a lot of people who set out to be experts in that, in that age group. A lot of times we're just waiting for them to get old enough to take them off the shelf and start pouring into them. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I love a good underdog story. I love that you use that word. I'm like, I'm all for the underdog. Yeah. And I do feel like middle school is an underdog, not just the phase of life, but the ministry. Mm -hmm. And I think often a lot of leaders find themselves, this is the first ministry they're trusted with versus mm -hmm. I have pursued to work with this age group. Wow. And I am so passionate about like, I feel, I felt called to middle school before I ever felt called to ministry. And I'm certified K through 12 in education. And I selected to work with middle school because I was like, they're so impressionable. Like we can go from asking a deep theological question to farting on each other's laps in a matter of three seconds. And it's right. horrible. Yeah. I'm like, so <laughs> like creating it an environment where we foster that and we, wow. we follow the rabbit trails with them and we create, we match the energy and we make a safe place for them to ask questions and mm -hmm. they don't process it. I mean, just developmentally looking at what a middle schooler is going through when they walk through puberty and I'm not just talking about the physical changes, but the mental changes, like their brain is literally doing a complete rewiring during puberty. There is no other time of life. Their brain is changing more than the first couple months of life. Wow. than in middle school. And so you're talking about their brain doing complete rewiring. And one of the things I talk about in my new book, Communicating to Middle Schoolers, is just we have this amazing opportunity as their brain is rewiring to actually hardwire truths like God loves me. Oh, good. And yeah. God wants to be walk through life with me. And God has purpose for me. Like we actually, as their brain rewires, have an opportunity to hardwire truths because the more that we say these truths to them as their brain rewires and settles in, the more it's it's more difficult to undo that truth that mm. that core truth that you believe in the future. Wow. So we have a chance to shape the inner narrative that they will speak to themselves for the rest of their life. And if we don't create an environment to do that at their level, I'm not just talking about a biblically biblically sound conversation, but a developmentally sound conversation. Mm -hmm. How do we break truth down? How do we not water it down or dumb it down, but break it down so that they can digest it? Wow in a way that makes sense to them. Uh, yeah. Wow, Ashley, it's so good. And you're such an expert in this. I mean, if people are unfamiliar with Orange, Orange is a massive organization creating content that is world-class. And I mean, you are in, like you are leading in this area. Like you are extremely intelligent on this conversation and you just had a new book come out, which is so cool. And I want us to talk a little bit about that because those watching, again, you guys might be, youth pastors, young adult pastors, you might be pastors of churches, you might be church planners, um, or maybe you're just like a volunteer in your youth ministry mm -hmm. and you really care about the next generation. Um, Ashley just wrote a phenomenal book. Yeah, so good. I read it. It was so fun because when I saw Ashley in Atlanta, Aaron was just about to speak at this big event for middle schoolers and yeah. he used to work with middle schoolers, but hasn't talked to them for a while, right? Like he went more yeah. into uh, doing this kind of stuff. And um, so it's just, it was so fun because I saw Ashton and I was like, your new book just came out. I need to get it for Aaron. He speaks in like a week. And she was like, here it is. I brought it home and he just started pouring through it. And this it's was so like, Anna, this is really good content. Yeah. So talk a little bit about your book, Ashley, and even why does it, why does it matter for anybody in ministry to understand the importance of the communication required for middle schoolers? Mm -hmm. Like why you touched a little bit on like this, it needs to be for their developmental season. Mm -hmm. um, 
like how, why, why does it matter so much when we're looking for people to invest in our middle schoolers mm. that we're, we're thinking through these things? Why does it matter for us as church leaders, church planters? Um, so talk about your book and then talk about why it's so important. Yeah, I, I wanted to create this um, resource because there aren't a ton of resources like it out there. There are a ton of amazing books on communication and trainings yeah. that you can go and become a great communicator. But I'm like, I, yeah, this is a book about great communication, but it's about who you're talking to yeah. because yeah. who you're talking to should determine how you talk. Yes. You know? Yeah. And so I, I was, I really wanted to create this resource because I think every single person who stands in front of a room of middle schoolers, whether it's four of them or it's 400 of them, yeah. Um, the way that they process information is different. And my biggest pet peeve in the world is when people say like, I'll just dumb the high school content down or the message down so middle schoolers can get it. I'm like, middle schoolers are so smart. They're yeah. so smart. They may be forgetful. They may be a little <laughs> awkward. They may say really random things or miss the joke or punchline, but they're <laughs> so smart and they can grasp really big concepts, but it isn't until puberty that they can think abstractly or process information in a way where they can experience doubt, express doubt, and critically think about the doubt they have. Mm -hmm. And so as they gain the ability to think abstractly, um, we have this unique opportunity as communicators to help them flex that muscle. My friend, Mark Ostriker always talks about, you know, when you gain the ability to think abstractly, it's like a wimpy muscle. It's not like one day you have it, or one day you don't have it and one day you do, it's you gain the ability, but you have to work it out in order for it to even work uh, properly. Wow. Faith is really abstract. I mean, everybody listening knows that. Yeah, and breaking wow. something so abstract down is a skill. And it, it is not a normal way you process information. Wow. And so when people say just dumb the content down or water down, I'm like, no, 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 no. Like it's about breaking it down. It's about defining it in your book. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Like, I mean, this is the, you know, think, take a toddler, for example, a toddler can eat a hamburger. They just can't eat it the way that an adult can. Uh -huh. They need yeah. it cut into smaller pieces so they can digest the very food they need to grow and survive. The wow. same thing is true for a middle schooler. You can take a really big, important faith concept, but if you don't break it down in digestible chunks, they're going to miss it. Wow. And faith and how faith informs our choices and the things we pursue in life, it's so important to communicate it in a way that makes sense to them in the middle school phase. So as they pursue an everyday faith, a faith that goes with them everywhere and everything, not just a Sunday faith, but a Monday through Saturday faith, it makes sense in their environment and mm -hmm. they can apply it in their environment. Wow, wow. wow. That's so, so great. good. Yeah. I, <laughs> wow. I feel so like- important. Yeah, I feel like I could talk about this forever, guys. This is so fun. I have so I many questions it. that are running through my mind, but like breaking it down, that's such a great thought because yeah. here's the thing I think with information is um, we, if we don't break down information, sometimes I feel like in our own minds or in our own hearts, even as adults, sometimes like we can get uh, maybe. Uh, we can't align our assignments mm -hmm. as followers of Jesus with without maybe some some specifics to run after, right? Mm -hmm. And so I feel like breaking it down is such a great concept because it really helps like mm -hmm. our helps helps us to align to an assignment that God's calling us to um, with a specific task. And so I love that breaking down that concept with for middle schoolers. Yeah. Um, I'm curious in your experiences, Ashley. When it comes down to breaking down concepts, um, could you maybe talk a little bit about flush out how you break down your talks, yeah, how you break yeah. down maybe your communication when you get up on stages or speak to middle schoolers? Could you just talk a little bit about how you break it down specifically yeah. for our audience? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Let me try to think of um, a specific example. Um, I mean, when I'm creating a talk for middle school, yeah. if I'm starting with scripture, whether, I mean, I love a good narrative or yeah. a good parable for middle school because they love a good story. Yes. Um, and you can incorporate props or, you yeah. know, pictures or yep. whatever. Um, so I, if I start with scripture, let's just say I start with scripture and I start with the words of scripture. What I do is I'll look through a few different translations and I'll ask myself, which of these translations gives the most context for what the heck we're talking about? So what wow. uses language? Like in my book, I also talk about don't use a $5 word when a five cent word suffices because yeah. 
You don't need to look fancy to a middle schooler. And the like listening comprehension is different than reading comprehension. So a middle schooler may know the answer to the definition of that word on an English test when they're reading it and doing it. But when a middle schooler is listening to your sermon or you reading scripture and they hear a word, they may have heard the word before, they will miss it. A yep. lot of times because they're listening to it. And in the context of what you're saying, they've never thought about that word. Wow. So wow. when I look at scripture, the first thing I do is I look at what word or phrase or abstract language do I need to give context to before they even are going to understand what this scripture even means. That's so that would be my first step in breaking it down. For Just a real quick, you know, this is so good. I'm learning alongside of you listeners and watchers. I... I used to lead a small group of middle school girls and I remember being in a sermon and then getting a small group and being like, all right, what did you guys learn? And they were like, I, what does this word mean? Mm. And I remember being confused. Like, I know that they read this in a book somewhere. Like, I know they know the word, Mm. like, you know, casualty. Like, I know they know this, but they couldn't process it fast enough. And they got hung up on that word. And then I would be like, they didn't get any of the message because they couldn't figure out what casualty means, <laughs> right, right? So right. that's so practical. So that that, so that makes sense to me. That's really good. Okay, keep going. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to think. So, I mean, that's where I start. And then yeah. asking myself, like, what information, like, what tension does this truth answer? Like, why do they care? Why does a middle schooler care about this? Yeah. Not why does an adult care about it? Or why should they care about it in the future? But like right now, why would a middle schooler care about this? And I try to find, I mean, I try to speak to any, uh, as many kids in the room as I can so that they understand contextually what this looks like in their life. Um, But I I just think through like, you know, why do they care about it to back up, you know, one step further? And then what do I want them to do with it? A lot of times we measure depth by amount of information, but I would argue that Depth is about application of information. You can know all the Bible verses in the world, but if you have no idea what to do with them or what it looks like applied to your life, then what good is it, you Mm -hmm. know? And so I would say just breaking down for a middle schooler in their everyday life and asking a lot of people in the process to help you either talk to middle schoolers directly and ask them like, what do you think of when you hear this? Or what questions come to mind when I say this? Yeah. Um, And it is so insightful because my brain doesn't work the same as a lot of theirs. And so I oftentimes, I still to this day, like, I I mean, this just happened. I don't always get this right. I was just speaking at a camp and I said from the stage, I said, um, sometimes Christians can be the worst, can't they? And middle schoolers didn't know what I meant. They did not know what I meant. They were like, huh? Okay. Mm -hmm. We all know what that means, right? But, yeah. and they know what they, if you, t- if you break that sentence down more, you would say, sometimes I feel judged by Christians and they would be like, yeah, I get that. So yeah. it's the same, it's the same way of talking, yeah. but I missed it by saying sometimes Christians can be the worst. And they're like, they've never had that thought before. Wow. Because they're concretely thinking, I feel judged by Christians sometimes. That's what they do. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's so it's wild. just the shift in the language because just the way I said it, they missed it. And they audibly let me know. They, they were like, huh? No. Huh? And I was like, oh, yeah. I just, like, oh, yeah. They that's, missed it. That's so good. Um, that's phenomenal. I have, a, I have a question then. Okay. Yeah. So what about that's the story great. arc, right? So mm-hmm. I feel like when you go into conferences or you come and preach at a camp and there's a uh, middle schoolers present or high school kids present, like, I feel Mm -hmm. like as adults, like what we do is we talk about like sermon series or we talk about, Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, hey, we're going to preach on this topical message or exegete this, this passage of scripture. But what about the story arc for middle schoolers? Like, what does that look like at Orange for you Mm -hmm. when it comes down to um, creating sermon series? Why should we create sermon series this way, Mm -hmm. specifically with middle schoolers or high school students? Because I feel like sometimes in the minutia of creating and building and just sometimes we're like, oh, we're going to have a four week sermon series on this, et cetera. But what about coming in as a speaker at a conference and you're speaking to middle schoolers? What is that story arc or what should that story arc be maybe when it comes down to the local church? Hmm. Um, Because I feel like sometimes we can lose um, 
lose maybe middle schoolers by trying to push a lot of content and maybe we're only supposed to do like one sermon and then we break it down in small groups for a couple of weeks like i would love to learn from you in this moment mm -hmm. of what is the what is the, like the proper story arc in today's culture what it, when it comes down to the local church and creating content for them that's good um are you saying like for an event or do you mean for like curriculum curriculum yep or uh mm -hmm. curriculum maybe that's attached to the local church specifically got it um so i would okay if we think about our best attending youth group kid okay let's just say like considering sickness yeah. family vacation maybe even divorce family situation within every other week like at the most we have like 40 hours a yeah. year to influence a teenager yeah. at the most right mm -hmm. so in that 40 hours what is the most important thing we want to say to them like mm -hmm. what do what truth do we want them to walk away with and how often do we need to revisit that truth because the way a sixth grader processes grace is a whole lot different than how a 12th grader processes grace yeah. and you know or freedom or whatever it is justice yeah, for sure and so um, we think through a lot of lenses. Um, I, I know our team sat down and as we, this, I'm not trying to sound overly spiritual, but as we went through scripture together, we read the whole Bible together as a team and pulled out every truth that we thought a teenager needs to know. Um, mm -hmm. Not just everything that would make a good sermon series, but what does a, what does a 12 year old need to know? What does a 17 year old need to know? Whether it's about a character story, whether it's about a parable, a narrative, um, a piece of really wise advice, like what is it that a teenager needs to know? And we put all of those on boards and there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cards. And then we're like, well, we have 40 hours a year to like how, so how do we categorize all of this and say like, well, these things really kind of go together. These things go, so we kind of categorize them, right? And we think through the filter of, not just what truth do they need to know, but when do they need to know it? Like what's going on in the life of a sixth grader in the fall? Well, there's a lot of transition and change happening in sixth grade until they're starting middle school or yeah. they're gonna be going through puberty right. or their family just moved to a new town or whatever. It's a start of a new school year. Maybe you're not, you have all new friends because you're not in any classes with your friends. So we think through what is happening in the life of a middle school and a high school student what are the truths we want them to know? And then we also think about the family rhythm because, mm -hmm. a, you know, everything functions by the school calendar, including a family calendar. And so what's happening on a family calendar in December, probably a wonderful holiday called Christmas. Like, you know, like, so what does the family calendar look like? And when is there a lot of tension in a family? Probably over the holidays when there's a lot of family in town or you have extra time with your family, right? So like, thinking through all of these lenses. And then it's like, okay, if we have 40 hours, how do we teach them the most important thing that makes sense in their life? Because maybe we don't teach a sixth grader about that yet because it's important, but it's not the 40 hour import, important, mm -hmm. you know? And that's like 40 hours is generous, in, you know, according to research, how often they're coming yeah. to church or to small group. And so um, we think through all of those lenses and then, when it comes to actually creating a series for them, um, how can we incorporate the truths that we pulled out so that it is a tension they're actually feeling and it's not something that we're feeling as a 38 year old or a 25 year old or a 22 year old, but the tension that a 13 year old is feeling when mm -hmm. they can't have a phone and all of their friends do, what is that tension and how do we speak to it? Wow. Um, or how do you earn trust with your parents? And so, and then I always think through it in pieces. Mm -hmm. I have a chapter in the book called Develop the Pieces of a Talk or a Sermon Series. And I'm always thinking, if I know what scripture I want to land on, I'm always thinking about what are a bunch of ways that we could illustrate this or make it dynamic in delivery, um, whether it's a story or it's like an inspiring video, like the winner of the Kentucky Derby, the underdog story there. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to teach about it. Haven't even used it yet, but I'm excited to. Um, and oh, how wow. do you start like pulling together this library of ideas? Because we live in a 15 second real world. Yeah. And how do we teach in a way that feels like it keeps their interest 
one of my, my friend, Kurt Johnston from Saddleback always talks about mm. how, um, attention spans might be getting shorter and shorter, but interest spans are still the same. Like a middle schooler can play Roblox for how eight hours, like they can do it because it has their interest. So how do we aim for interest rather than attention when it comes to a middle schooler? Like, how can we be dynamic in our delivery? How do we reach all learning styles? How do we engage all the senses so that when they walk on the more senses that we engage and the more learning styles that we engage, the better chance they have of retaining the information. So, so those are some of the Man, I hope that you all are taking so many good notes because this that, is so yeah, powerful. That that thought process about interest yeah. is so intriguing to me. Like, yeah. how do we build ministries that are building up the interest in the person yeah. over just like the content that we can deliver to the person? That's like, I'm not going to be chewing on that for the yeah. next couple of weeks. That's great. It's so good. Ashley, you're brilliant. Uh, for those watching, if you, again, are a leader, pastor, youth pastor, and you're thinking, man, the, uh, there's somebody in my community, in my church that needs to hear this. Maybe you're a youth pastor of middle schoolers and you've been trying to like give more vision to your middle school volunteers. Like this is going to be available for you starting on Monday for mm -hmm. replay and you guys can send this to them so they can join you in some of this learning. Um, Ashley, such a beautiful conversation. And, and something that, again, we're talking about here is the fact that you as a leader, I mean, you are here because you saw a woman that was leading. You had male youth pastors um, that were working above you when you were a volunteer that noticed things in you. Like these are all things that we can mm. recreate in our own churches, in our own communities to raise up even more mm. Ashley's. And so to the pastors that are watching this, Ashley, like what are some 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 words of inspiration or maybe mm. even like practical advice that you would want to give them to raise up more women just like you who can continue to work and, and reach the next generation. Totally. What is what does that look like for us to be intentional to raise up more women like you? Oh, I love that. Um, I mean, look for opportunities. Like every compliment counts. Don't assume a kid knows how awesome they are. Um, and when you see a kid do something awesome or like surprising or catches your breath because it's like, well, I was not that smart at 14. I would never have thought of it that way. Like that was brilliant. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Don't assume they know how awesome they are. So encourage the heck out of them, like become the biggest member of each of their hype squads. And whether it's a teenager or a 20 year old girl, who's trying to declare a major in school yeah. and is very mm -hmm. confused about is it okay for me to declare this major? Mm -hmm. And so I would say, be figure out who you can encourage, yeah. um, whether that's, and, and then privately encourage and publicly encourage. Yeah. Because a lot of times what women need is for, I hate saying this, yeah. they need men to publicly affirm that they believe that they, are, they yeah. belong there. Yes. And mm -hmm. so I would say, look for opportunities to do that and then give opportunities away. Yeah. Like use your platform to yeah. lift other people's voices, other people's gifting. I mean, what you guys are doing um, yeah. is so inspiring to me because that's exactly what you're using your platform to do. And it is making such an impact in ways you don't even know yet. You know, yeah. you don't know how many kids have seen you two stand on a stage and been yeah. like, what? I want to do something like that, or that just spoke to me in a way nobody else has ever spoken to me. So how do we become raving fans of the next generation and encourage them and yeah. equip them? Because mm -hmm. if we don't as church leaders, then we hand the leadership of the church off to a generation who is not equipped to make it better. Yeah. Mm. That is a lot that hangs in the balance. That's right. Come on. I mean, Ooh. I just got, I've mm. gotten chills so many times. Close it up. That's a wrap. <laughs> Yo, I, wow. I often say like, That's good. as, as a, as a charge to us as wow. leaders, like Jeez. we, we just, yeah, let's not lose the generation on our own watch. Like just not on our watch. And I love that. That's the challenge that you just issued us. Ashley is, is it's up to us to be the people that equip the next generation. If we're so concerned mm -hmm. about the future of the church, if we're so concerned that the next generation is walking away from Jesus, either we keep 
getting scared about it and looking for someone to blame or we just roll up our sleeves and we do it ourselves mm. and we recognize there there is a middle schooler on our street there's a high schooler in our church mm. there's a college kid in our community like there even if it's one person how are we going to say that young person that next mm. gener like not on my watch mm. are they going to be alone isolated or not understanding the love that Jesus has for them and so Ashley mm. you do this so well you set the pace you lead the way as a as a young woman in ministry I'm deeply grateful for women like you who are blazing trails who are doing it with humility and confidence mm. and the authority that God has given you and so I'm just I'm grateful for the role that you have yeah. in our world uh, those watching uh, definitely you're going to want to go ahead and get Ashley's book for anyone that works with the next gen in your church in your community read it yourself because I, I promise yes, you agreed. especially if you have middle schoolers like in your Sunday morning gatherings or you will have middle schoolers if you're going right, to have kids right let's like let's like let's learn how to even make our Sunday mornings like relatable to these next gen leaders so ashley where can they go to find out more of your content um, more about your book and even if they're interested in, in looking more into the orange curriculum as well yes um you can go to communicating to middle schoolers.com um there's a uh, some free resources you can download there about just just little ways to help you make your messages more friendly to a middle school audience and then you can get my book on amazon or thinkorange.com um, you can learn more about our curriculum and our organization and resources. And that's wow. the name of the book, Communicating to Middle Schoolers. Yes. I, let me show you. Yes. So the, also, it's Woo! brilliant. Erin really commented on the cover and was like, it's just so smart. It's all things that yeah. like are so relevant to middle schoolers. So we love the cover. Ashley, quick question. We we have like just a couple minutes left. Um, I would love if, if you have any parting thoughts to senior leaders, people that oversee next gen, maybe something that you would love to touch on before we close this webinar out. I would love to just open it up for whatever you would love to communicate. Maybe it's a heartfelt need, something you really care about, something you're really passionate about, something that maybe we need to hear. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. So <laughs> I feel like the thing that I have been thinking so much about, and I don't fully have the answer of what, but I do have the tension of, I feel like over the last two years, more than ever, the church has decentralized. Mm -hmm. School has decentralized. Friendships have decentralized. Mm -hmm. And it's not that it's, it's not that I'm saying we shouldn't bring them back together, but we as ministry leaders, we're feeling the tension of teenagers or kids or families being at tournaments on the weekends or traveling or, you know, they're only here every other, we were already feeling that gap in attendance prior to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And then the pandemic hit and nobody could show up for a while. Right. So how do we as a church lean into that tension? And instead of making kids and teenagers and families feel guilty about having a life outside of the church building, how do we turn the volume up on the way that we use social media, the way we leverage social media? So wow. as things decentralize, that we as the church are going to where teenagers are, to where families already are. How do we take our content and make it accessible for the family who's driving the six kids from your youth group to a soccer tournament who could listen to a message and have a small group in the car on the drive? Like, how do wow. we decentralize wow. what, we're cre what we're creating and make it accessible to families? And how do we partner with parents to help them engage their kids in spiritual conversations, because I think it's scary for us, but this yeah. means we need to rethink our budgets and yeah. we need to rethink our volunteer structures to create volunteer roles that have to do with social media or YouTube or whatever it is. And so that we can show up where our teenagers already are, because then we don't have to create momentum. It's already there. We just have to wow. show up. Yo, that's <laughs> a word. And honestly, I just think that's a picture of the innovation that has to happen if we're going to reach the next generation. And if you're a church leader and you're trying to figure out like, how do I innovate? How do I, how do I, how do mm. I make our church grow younger? Mm -hmm. How do I, mm -hmm. how do I build a church for the future? Chances are, this is a great example. Chances are the people who are working with the next gen in your church are already thinking like that mm. because they Bring have to, Bring because them in. they have to, right? Like we, we don't have any, 
we can't do anything but innovate because when we're working mm. with the next generation, they're just not going to show up if it's like it's always been. Mm. We have to innovate. And so, yeah. Ashley, what you just gave is a picture to the senior leaders who are watching right now so of what is happening already in the minds of the next gen leaders in their church. Yeah. The youth pastor in their church is probably already thinking like that, right? Like the 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 kid that, that is volunteering with your eighth graders that's 18 himself like probably is already thinking like this, right? Mm. So bring in the people working with the next generation to innovate for the future mm. of the church. Yeah, yeah, that's so good. Ashley, wow. I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much yeah. um, as a male figure. Thank you for leading from the front. Yeah. Thank you for leading when sometimes your voice may be overlooked. Mm. Um, so I just want to say I'm super grateful for what you've done, yeah. not only just staying in it for the long haul, yeah. 20 plus years of just leading the next generation. Yeah. Like this world just has your fingerprints all over it, just like generational chains, just breaking through you. So yeah. I'm just super grateful for how you stayed committed to yeah. the vision that God has placed in your heart. Um, Ashley, we are grateful for this conversation. Yes, you dropped so, so much good. wisdom. Um, I'm just, I'm like, yo, can we have Ashley on the show every week? <laughs> yeah, every week. Let's do it. <laughs> Ashley and Hannah show. Yeah. You're on out. I'm in. Yeah, I'm, we're grateful. So yeah. thank you so much for being on. I would just love to pray over you and yeah. to pray over this conversation yeah. and, yeah. Um, and the future future of the church so father yeah. i just thank you so much for this time thank you that we get to be here and just uh hang yeah uh father i just thank you for your spirit um how it just corrects and guides mm -hmm. father i just thank you for ashley's life uh father as we just um as a community right now i pray that we'll just quiet our minds and hearts mm -hmm. and just pray over ashley father i just thank you for her leadership i thank you for her voice uh, Father, as she put the words in this book, Father, I just pray that you'll just bring them to life. I pray that a greater story will be written um, from the story and that she wrote and the pages in this book, Father. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, God, I just thank you that you've just um, equipped her for the work that's ahead. Father, I just ask that you'll just uh, turn your face towards her, give mm -hmm. her favor, Father as she leads the next generation. Um, I pray that she'll just continually be the person that she is, quick to empower, quick to encourage, quick to celebrate, yeah. quick to listen, quick to love. So Father, I just thank you for her. Um, I thank you for Orange and what they're doing. I pray that you'll just um, give them grace in this season as mm -hmm. they're innovating for the next. And so, uh, yeah, God, we just thank you for this conversation. Thank you for all the wisdom that I gleaned and Hannah and I gleaned. Um, I pray that we'll implement it deep into our ministries quicker. Yeah. Um, pray that we'll be people that say, yeah, that's good. How do I change this? Take it mm -hmm. back to change environments, to uh, look more like you, to, to feel next gen so that the next generation can actually be seen and heard and equipped mm -hmm. to, to lead the next generation behind them of uh, people that are following after you. And mm -hmm. so, Father, I thank you for this time. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you so much for having me on. This was amazing. Yeah. This was so awesome. You are thanks awesome. for joining us, Ashley. And for those watching, thanks for joining us for another episode of the Generation Next Show. We will see you not next week. We'll be off next week, but the following week we'll be back with even more content on how to reach the next generation. We'll see you guys then. Bye.